session. So if you're joining us today, hello, my name is Kimber Andrews and I'm an assistant director at the Center for the Enhancement and Learning and with Faculty Enrichment Center, we put together a wellness week um, for faculty and staff called Balance Boundaries. Um, and burnout. And today we have an amazing panel of, of faculty and staff who have taken part of the Mind Body Skills Program through the um, through the Integrative Medicine Department. And today we're going to um, be able to ask them questions about their experiences, not only um, being part of that program, but also their experience helping students learn some of these practices and skills. Um, just some housekeeping notes today. I have all of our panelists spotlighted for you so you can see them on screen. Um, however, if you'd like to turn your camera on, you're welcome to. If you want to leave it off, you can. Um, you're also welcome to unmute yourself at any point in time to ask a question or monitoring the chat. So you can also type questions in the chat and I can make sure that those get addressed. Um, if you look, if you're not familiar with Zoom, if you look to the bottom left hand side of your um, of your screen, you'll see a little microphone. It's a mute button. Then next to that is video. And if you look towards the center of the screen, see chat at the bottom, and that will open up a chat window over onto the right hand side of your screen. If you have any technical issues or questions as well, please go ahead and type those into the chat. Without further ado, I want to start by just introducing Susie McDonald, who will um, go ahead and, and introduce the rest of the group. Thanks, Kimber. Uh, I'm Susie McDonald. I'm a senior research assistant uh, with the Center for Integrative Health and Wellness and the program manager for the Mind Body Skills program, which we're going to talk about today. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. So I'm going to just go around with how you guys are in order on my screen. Uh, we have Lori Wilson from DAP. We have Vince DeGeorge from CCM. Jen Milano from the College of Medicine, Rachel Smith from the College of Law, and Leslie Razor Becker from our College of Allied Health. Yay! <laughs> um, so just to give a little bit back, more background about the Mind Body program, um, it's a nine-week course that we offer for students, faculty, and staff. Um, you learn a different mind body medicine skill each week and also do a lot of group connection and debriefing and talking about your experience um, learning these different skills. Uh, all of these panelists have also attended our three-day immersive facilitator training, which trains them to lead these uh, groups for nine weeks. So they'll all talk about their experiences, uh, leading groups, maybe even how the training was for them. Uh, my little plug is that we do have another training coming up in May. We also have one scheduled for November. So if this is something that you are interested in bringing to your college or your students, um, please reach out to me and I would love to talk to you more about it. So Lori, I think you were going to maybe get us started off with an activity. So I'll go ahead and share the image. Does that sound okay? Yep. Perfect. Great. So talking before I unmuted myself, maybe one day we'll figure out how that works. Um, okay. So um, I, I think you guys probably realize that, you know, our, our senses and our physical experiences are very much linked to our mental experiences. And that's why mind body, um, really has that terminology, right? And that's the importance of it that, um, you know, what we experience uh, physically can really help us with issues or, or things that we're, ex we're experiencing um, through our thought process as well. So um, I have a, uh, an exercise that we utilize in, uh, in our training uh, that I think really illustrates that. Um, I always said that when I smelled pipe tobacco that was old hickory, I'd think of my dad, right? So, you know, I mean, that that's just one of those illustrations. So, so we're going to do this, and I would uh, prefer that you close your eyes in this process just because, uh, take a good look at the image, uh, but I think that it allows you to uh, really immerse yourself as we walk through this. So I think everybody probably recognizes the photo on the screen, and so if you don't mind, just sit back, relax and close your eyes as I kind of talk you through this visualization. Okay, so I want you to uh, pretend that you are about to slice 
a, a ripe, juicy lemon. Um, I want you to think about picking it up off of the counter and holding it in your hand. Um, think how it feels in your hand. Firm, possibly, maybe you squeeze it a little bit. Notice its pores. Maybe you think about running your fingers over the surface of the lemon and, and just feeling how it feels. It's not necessarily smooth, right? It, it has texture to it. Um, now I want you to think about setting it down and taking up a knife in your other, in your, whatever your cutting hand is and slice into that lemon with that knife. Now I want you to imagine the sound that it makes when you slice into it. Kind of like it's, it's just opening up all of the wonderful, um, juiciness within, right? So you slice through the skin, think about the sound that it makes as you cut through that. Now you'll have two halves lying on the, on the cutting board that you're looking at. So you see beads of juice forming on those pale sections of pulp, right? Notice the whiteness in the pith of it, maybe a seed or two in there. And now carefully cut one of the halves in two and now pick up one of those quarters of that lemon. I want you to think about bringing it up to your nose and just smelling that tart lemony aroma, taking it in. Now think about in your mind, lifting that lemon wedge now to your mouth and imagine bringing it to your lips and, and just briefly tasting that juice on your lips and then biting into it. Now set that sour juice into your mouth. Just imagine that, right? Now, I want you to open your eyes and come back together here with us. Now, is anybody out there salivating, right? Um, you're having a little bit of taste. Um, it was a trick that we used to play with my daughter when she was a little girl and um, she loved lemons for whatever reason. We'd go out to dinner and, you know, somebody would have a lemon on their drink and we would hand it to her and she'd immediately put it in her mouth and, she, and she'd just like cringe. Um, but she'd just shake her head. And, and so I think we all can relate to that experience. So what this, what this brings out is that even though you didn't have a lemon in front of you, um, you know, you didn't taste it, you didn't smell it, but you could, right? Anybody have a comment on that experience at all? Yeah. Even my friends? <laughs> now, just like the start of it, when I start like imagining the lemon, my mouth already starts watering. I have like conditioned myself, not like the second we start talking about lemons, my mouth starts watering. <laughs> Isn't that funny? And and I'm so glad that I tell everybody to close their eyes because usually I have something dripping <laughs> in my face when I do it because it really starts everything, <laughs> right? So that's that's just a brief experience. Vince, did you want to say something? Well, yeah, it also just like brought me such joy from the very beginning because I love to cook and we get to cook. So, I get to cook so much right now. Right. And um, so just even like, you know, just the, the beginning of the whole thing was like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to cook a dinner. I'm going to cook something. And that yeah. like really does something to me now. Right. Right. Um, I think along. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say along with Vincent when you were describing it, like there was so much joy in it for me. And it was something so simple as like cutting a lemon. And I it made me a little bit sad because I was thinking about like all the experiences that I probably am not tuned into and mindful enough to like take in. Um, and so it just made me think about like all the other great things that are way better than cutting a lemon. Um, but yeah, it just, it felt kind of eye opening for me in that way. <clears throat> the simple things, if we just slow down and we're present, right? So that's what we're here to talk about today. So thank you guys for taking that little journey with me. Kimber, back to you. Yeah. So I have a list of questions that I could ask um, that are of my own interest, but this panel is for really the who came and showed up. So I'm curious if people um, have any questions, they can start to type those in the chat, or as Darby did, just unmute yourself and feel free to ask them. We're a nice group. Um, so um, 
I want to go ahead and leave that option option open so people can do that, but I do have a question to start out with. <laughs> Get us going so people get their questions. So all of you decided to do this mind body program. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit at expectations or what maybe was the inspiration or impulse to try to to go for it and to do this program and what you thought you might gain from it. And then afterwards, were there unexpected things that you gained and, and ways in which maybe that has the program has filtered into your life in ways that were unexpected? Kimber, I'd be happy to answer that question because I, um, I, and maybe a lot, like I know some of my, my friends, um, fellow panelists feel the same way is I, I got interested in this because I noticed the increase in my students' stress level, um, especially when they were applying to graduate school or they were new graduate students um, and, and an increase in mental health issues with my students. And I wanted ways to support them. Um, and so when this came up as an opportunity in the College of Al Allied Health Sciences uh, um, several years ago, I jumped on it. I, I remember you know, running to the, to the Dean to say like, I wanna do this. and. But, but your, your follow-up question about what have you gotten out of it? Because I, I truly say this has changed who I am. Um, and it, because I, I've, I've learned so many skills, I've learned a lot about myself. I've made lifelong friends in the process too. Um, but I, you know, I, I do these groups quite frequently as Susie described. And I, um, and I tell people I do them uh, I, I lead the groups with the students because it's not much of an obligation for me. It, it is actually, a, it returns to me like tenfold what, um, what we do with the students and just the, the, the weekly practice of mindfulness has been just remarkable for me. And it's, and it's, it's changed my, my approach to a lot of things, even in my parenting and in my personal life. I'm, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. oh thanks. I, I was going to add to what Leslie said, and I, it's not much different. I teach at the law school, and I noticed our students were incredibly stressed out. We know at the law school that people enter with the regular amount of mental health problems, but by the time we graduate them, they have many more. So we knew we had to do something and I had the opportunity to come do this training but I wasn't a meditator beforehand I was someone who whenever I had to sit quietly and just breathe I would get anxious and so I really was kind of a skeptic and so the way it's changed my life or had the impact is I meditate now and luckily Susie and Sean and our other leaders and my fellow participants were so supportive during that training and working with students every semester, it just builds on that. As Leslie said, it gives back more than it takes from me. And I really actually need it. Even if I'm doing it for the students, I get so much out of it. But um, it's brought some mindfulness and some techniques into my life that help me deal with my depression and my anxiety, as well as knowing that I can offer something that might work for some of our students, maybe not for everyone, but for at least a lot of them. Um, I was, I was just going to say the same thing. I mean, you're going to hear a lot of the same experiences here. I think, uh, for me, uh, when Sean came to speak to the faculty, I'm at DAP. And when Sean came to speak to the faculty, we were one of the first colleges, uh, along with, uh, the college of law CCM that, um, was encouraged to bring this into, um, our college. And she came to speak to our faculty and I, I literally chased her out of the meeting when she left. And I said, I had one of those moments, like um, you feel like if you're in church and you realize that when they're talking to you, that there's nobody else around, they're only talking to you. And I, and I had that experience. And uh, one of my roles at DAP is to run our summer, um, our DAP camps, our summer programming for high school students. We've run it since 2011. And the summer prior to her coming to talk to us, out of 150 residential high school students, we had over 60 of them bringing meds of some sort with them. And most of them were to deal with ADHD, anxiety, depression, things like that. And I was just shocked. I was, my heart just ached because I thought if you're at this point now, 
what's going to happen when you get into high, you know, get into college. Um, so that was really my driving point. Um, but, um, you know, we were able to bring it back. DAP is a very volatile environment, you know, a lot of creatives and, um, you know, tensions and anxieties are high. There's a lot of performance anxiety in that, you know, just like CCM for Vincent. Um, but uh, for me personally, just like Leslie, and Leslie was my first person I got to, to co-facilitate with, um, it's just been a tremendous gift. And I'm, I'm an old dog and I've tried a lot of tricks along the way and Tai Chi and yoga and all of that, but I'd never had a practice. And there's a difference between, you know, meditating once a month because you feel like you should and having a practice. Um, and so that weekly gathering in our classes with, with, you know, when we teach our mind body programs that starts to develop at least once a week practice for students. Uh, and then the encouragement that we give them to try to bring that into their everyday life, even if it's five minutes, right? Um, it's beneficial. So um, just like Rachel said, it's changed my life. I've, my friends would say, you have no margin, you know, like in your photos of your life, there's no mat around it. You're all the way to the edge of the frame. And um, I've developed some margin. And especially this last year, it has been uh, just a kind of a lifesaver. So. So um, I'm Jen Milano. I'm, I'm with the College of Medicine and, and Rachel and I um, we're in the same training group together. So, um, so lovely to see you um, as well as everybody else. But, you know, I actually did the um, mindfulness best based uh, stress reduction program, um, the full eight week course when I was a fellow at the Mayo Clinic. So I'd had some experience with mindfulness um, coming in to mind body and, and mind body training and, and was actually working um, on wellness activities and initiatives with the American Acad Academy of Neurology um, before actually doing things locally. Um, and so, you know, when I met Sean and heard about the mind body skills program, I was like, definitely want to do this. Um, I think that would be really cool. But um, and it, it's opened my eyes in, in a way that I had not expected. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I've benefited from um, with the training program itself was just trying to get outside of my comfort zone a little bit. Um, our first exercise was to do a drawing exercise. And my first response was, I do not draw. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, but did it and found a lot of benefit from it. And, um, you know, I think um, it was really kind of my first time I'd been here. I've been with uh, UC um, since like 2010. Um, but really had only known people within my neurology department bubble, right? So I'm a neurologist by training. I'm a sleep specialist, a dementia specialist, and knew pretty much most people within my department, but didn't really know anyone outside of the department. But with the training, was able to meet people from the law school, like Rachel and, and Chris, as well as, you know, some of my other colleagues in the College of Medicine that in, in other departments like surgery, um, family medicine, which was really wonderful. Um, I think in terms of, you know, trying to incorporate it in terms of daily life and, and you know, teaching the students this, you know, it's, it's, you know, wellness is not a one size fits all sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, um, like, many others were saying, you know, giving people various tools to put in their toolbox that they can use um, to their liking. I, th I think one of the, the best things that of mind body, the, the mind body skills group is just, you know, the, the, the idea is to just to be open to the experience. And if it works for you, it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, then we'll find something else or you'll find something else. And I think that's been a lesson that um, I've been able to teach my learners um, and my colleagues as we've been doing some of this work. So it's been really great. And, um, you know, the nice thing about doing the mind body skills group is that it's actually scheduled self care time, <laughs> which is a challenge um, sometimes in, in terms of, you know, when you when we all have busy schedules, right? So it's like, oh, it's on my calendar, like, this is something that I have to do. And, um, and, and it brings not only that sense of connection, um, but also brings me makes helps me feel grounded because you know sometimes it's still a practice and it's still a work in progress like I practice, but 
but I'm, it's an imperfect practice for me. Um, so, you know, having the opportunity to start out with the lemon visualization exercise, which to be quite honest with you, I haven't done in quite a while, <laughs> was, was really nice. And it's nice to bring that back. And so, um, yeah, it's wonderful. So yeah, I'm very happy to be here and share what other, what other lessons I've learned and to hear what um, our, our colleagues also have learned as well. So thank you for having me be here. So uh, when I heard about this program, it, it was sort of right up my alley. I'm a, I'm a researcher that does uh, physical research into awareness. So physical awareness, sensory awareness, awareness of space and time. And then I went to this, to the weekend, which was amazing. But I have to say, I was also like super skeptical about it because I was sort of like, well, these skills are sort of simple. They're, they're not, they're not, um, they're not really complicated skills. And I was just wondering how, what kind of effect it would have on me and then the effect that it would have on my students. And, um, and it was also a little confusing to me. Like I didn't quite, I didn't, couldn't quite get my head around everything. Um, and what I will tell you now that I must be in like my third or fourth year of doing these skills in particular and then getting more training and now training uh, not just our students but uh, faculty and staff at CCM and for me it, it keeps coming back to the community that we're building and this culture that we're changing sort of one session at a time and um, it's actually making my workplace a better place to be and that is not what I had in mind or what it was at all in uh, what I thought I would be experiencing from this. And uh, we just finished a session with our dean was part of it. And um, it's really pretty incredible to see uh, our dean and faculty and staff sharing these skills and sharing their experience in a very different way than we ever uh, would you know, when we're seeing each other in the halls or in a meeting. So I think that's the biggest surprise effect it's had on me. Kimber, I can talk a little bit about the research. I feel like Vince kind of kind of led into that in all of these. I mean, those were all great responses and you can hear that it, you know, we hear all the time it's life changing, those types of things. We do evaluate this program and um, our outcomes are significant improvements in stress, anxiety, sleep disturbance, mindfulness, um, positive and negative affects. We see more good mood, less bad mood. Um, and then we also, we actually just published a paper on the long-term effects of the course. So we do pre post right before everyone participates right afterwards. And then we followed up with them a year later to see if any of those great outcomes you know, were sustained for a year. Um, mindfulness is the only one that stays, that is sustained uh, over that year after completing the course, which really just tells us that when you're learning these skills, clearly the mindfulness part sticks, that, that sticks in your brain and changes how you're thinking about things even when you're not participating. But there's other measures like anxiety and stress and sleep and um, mood and all of those go back to what we saw prior to participating, which again is just telling us the participation part is key, that group connection. I know that that was probably one of the biggest surprises for me in mind body. I thought, oh, well, mindfulness, you know, meditation, that seems so isolated. You know, you're sitting there by yourself doing it. That doesn't really involve other people, but um, the connections I've made with all of you, with all of our faculty and staff. I mean, we're in, I think, 10 or 11 of the 13 colleges at UC. Um, this is, you know, just some of us. I think there's over, trained over 70 faculty and staff that has become like a family. I mean, that connection there and then the connections that form within each group with the students or with faculty and staff, um, that that has been surprising to me and probably like the most rewarding part of it, um, definitely. Wow. Susie, that 
I feel like was such a great summary to maybe take us into, we had a little pre-conversation that it'd be nice to pepper this panel conversation with some practice, because this has come up that practice is so important. And Jen was saying this imperfect practice, but we we keep doing it. And we're saying, Susie, this mindfulness thing sticks. And Leslie, today, I thought this was a great segue into wanted to lead us into a practice, um, because there is something really amazing about getting to some community, even if we're all in tiny little Zoom boxes. <laughs> there's a power in um, getting to know that we're all sitting doing this together. So Leslie, I wanted to go ahead and follow you. Um, so we could do a kind of midway through the panel practice, and then I have a couple other questions, but please feel free to add more into the chat if our panel, if our participants have questions. Yeah, thank you. So I had wanted to lead a um, loving kindness, and it's kind of long. Um, so I thought what I would do is kind of do a hybrid where I would do, we'll focus on our breathing, um, but I'm going to throw in a little self-love um, um, our way today with a little bit of a script around um, self-love. And I have to tell my panelists that I'm drinking Harney and Sons tea right now. Just I'm channeling the Murph and Ridge in. So um, that's probably a little inside joke with them, but so I, I do want to uh, remind everybody, you don't have to close your eyes, you know, obviously your, your cameras are, are, are off, but um, find yourself in a comfortable position and just know you have nowhere else to be right now, nothing else to do. And this is, this is your time. So, uh, you know, close those windows, <laughs> whatever you've got to do to come into focus here. Um, get yourself into a comfortable position, your head, neck, spine aligned, that feels right for you your feet, your legs, your arms in a position that feel just, just right. And as you find yourself settling down, begin noticing your breathing. Focus on breathing in and breathing out. You don't have to change your breathing in any way. The way you're breathing right now is just fine. Just bring your attention to it. Your inhalation, your exhalation. On your next inhalation, imagine that you're breathing in peace, calmness, tranquility. And as you exhale, Imagine that you're breathing out any of that tension or anxiety, discomfort, pain, it's going away with your exhalation. Breathe in peace and exhale tension. Just a couple minutes to spend some time with our breath. If you notice that your mind is wandering while we focus on our breath, it's okay. Don't judge yourself. Just come back to the breath. In, out. Noticing our breathing. You have nowhere else to be. Right now, your focus is on your breath. And now I'd like for you to think of a person close to you, someone who loves you very much, 
It could be someone from the past or the present, someone still in life or someone who's passed on. It could be a spiritual teacher or a guide. Imagine that person standing on your right side and they're sending you their love. That person is sending you wishes for safety, for well being, and for happiness. Feel the warm wishes, feel that love coming from the person towards you. Feel that love. Now bring to mind someone else who cherishes, it, cherishes you deeply. That person standing on your left side. They're sending you love. Wishes for wellness, for health, for happiness. Feel that kindness. Feel that warmth coming towards you. Now imagine that you're surrounded on all sides, all around you, front, back, left, right, by the people who love you, who have loved you. Picture all your friends, your loved ones, everyone surrounding you. They're standing, sending you wishes for happiness, well-being, for your health. Let's spend a moment basking in that warm feeling of love, those warm wishes coming from all sides. You are filled, you are overflowing with warmth, in with love. Now, when you're ready, slowly, gently bring yourself back into the Zoom call. Wiggle your fingers and your toes. Feeling loved, supported, and warm. Well, Leslie, thank you so much. I, I mean, I feel like um, moving through that process, it really brings uh, that sense of community that you're talking about and the way um, that everyone was talking about how it not only changes yourself, but it begins to maybe change um, the things around you. So I wanted to pivot right now to a question. And again, people can unmute themselves and type in the chat, but I thought I'd just throw a question out there um, for to respond to. I was really moved by what you said, Lori, about when you noticed that all these students were coming in with medication. And Rachel, you said they were already coming into an environment that, like if they weren't stressed out, they may be coming <laughs> into an environment that has um, definite kind of strength in it for, you know, for all kinds of things, their competitive programs. And so I'm curious in this experience, you guys have, all, many of you have led these for students and led them for students. How do you feel like that has changed their ability to kind of manage and cope with, you know, not only just the everyday stress, but then also the academic rigor and the stress that comes with that. So I'll throw that out. And again, other people, please post things you want to know in the chat, but maybe we can get started with that in our second half of the interview.
I know I mentioned just like our research outcomes, which we see, you know, from the students, but um, we, we ask a lot of qualitative questions for that. Too. I'm talking about it from the research side, since that's the side I'm on. And I see all their responses that come back in. And um, I can tell you that oftentimes, like it brings tears to my eyes to see students saying that you know, how badly they needed this. I mean, I can remember one student saying that she probably would not have continued with med school if it hadn't been for participating in this course because it just she did she wasn't finding her place and through mind body she found her place um that's just one example but i feel like that that's what i often hear from the students is you know being able to connect with other students but not just about school like going a little bit deeper and getting a little more personal also feeling like because we have faculty and staff leading the groups feeling like the faculty members actually care about them you know care about them deeper than you know just giving them a grade but like how are you doing really and um yeah that, that's definitely what i what i see from the feedback that they give us on the program level i think um the other thing too is, um, you know, one of the student groups that I led was a mix of college, like students from different colleges. So we had College of Medicine, College of Nursing, CCM. Um, and I think it was in terms of community, it was like this realization that, you know, it, sometimes people feel like they're alone in their stressors and managing their stressors. And I think just understanding that you're not alone um, I think that has been, uh, that was a lesson that um, I think I had learned and a lesson that, uh, you know, the students that, that I had worked with um, have learned as well. And I think that was, you know, that sense of community, I, community comes up a lot in, in many different, many different ways. But I think the other um, thing of it, the, the, the other piece of it too, as a faculty member, you know, is, is that, um, you know, if I'm going to be promoting wellness, I have to be able to be a good role model of wellness to my students. And so by, by doing that and by doing my body, that, that allows me that space to do that and that space to be vulnerable as well and to say, hey, you know, the stressors don't end after med school. The stressors don't end after you're in school. They, they, they continue. And it's like, how do you find ways to increase your resilience and your capacity in order to, um, you know, attack those stressors in a way that keeps you in a like in that ready state so that you're able to respond um, in a way that's productive, um, both personally and professionally. And so, um, you know, I think those are some important things too. I think some other things, um, you know, that, that um, you know, you don't necessarily need two hours of time in order to do a mind-body practice. So, you know, some of the things that um, um, I try to do, and I know that some of my other colleagues have done who've gone through the mind-body skills program is, you know, before you're, you know, before you see a patient, you know, if you're touching that doorknob before you see a patient, take a deep breath, right? So that it centers you into the world of that patient because each patient room is a different world, right? Or before you, um, before you turn on your computer and see all the emails that you have to do and all the th things that you have on your to-do list, right? Take those three deep breaths as a, as a grounding practice. And so I think, you know, being able to um, incorporate ways that you can um, bring those in practically throughout the day, um, I think has also been something that um, the, the learners and students that I've worked with have benefit, benefit, benefited from, so. I, I agree with Jen and, uh, you know, I think something that we realized was that at DAP, it's a very unique space and um, when the students need it the most is when they feel like they can give the time the least, you know, so like we have Hell Week, which is when all of their projects are due and, um, you know, we would find that and, and Every, my colleagues and, and uh, Susie knows this, we struggled in the beginning to get that cohort of students who would say, I'm going to come for an hour or an hour and a half each week. I'm going to commit to that, commit to themselves. And it was really difficult for them and it's still difficult for them. But um, interestingly enough, when we did um, our last one virtually, 100% um, 
they were there 100%. So they're not being pulled in so many different directions. And I think it, it really gave them um, that opportunity to um, have that gathering of people that we're so starved for, you know, everybody is. Um, and, and we've heard, you know, that just a great feedback from the students who have participated and hung in there that um, even the vulnerability, um, and that leads back to what you were saying, Jen, the approachability of those of us who are facilitators, that for us to share the things that we're dealing with as well, right? You know, if we've got something going on, when we sit in a circle and we talk, we're going to lay that out there. And they really appreciate that because sometimes they don't realize that we're human beings as well. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm at DAP, I'm known as Mama Wilson and that they, you know, my door's there and they can stick their heads in. So what it's done for that relationship is that they feel like they can continue to come in. I'm sure my, uh, my friends here have the same situation in their colleges as well, that they kind of continue that connection to you all, so. Yeah, I want to echo some of the things that you know we're hearing on, from the other panelists. I, I think we can't um, overstate how important it is or how um, impactful it is for our students to see us in a different way and for us to see our students in a different way and to relate to them in a different way. And I mean, I teach acting. So, I mean, we're all up in there and our emotions, but um it, this is it's just different it's just framed differently there's no end result that we're heading for there's no test there's no um it, it's just the structure is so different that it actually i think that has a big impact on the students um and i do see immediate results with some of the students right who like come in really like needing this i i think the the sort of uh, next maybe hurdle for us is consistency. And I'm talking about like us at CCM, like we're seeing like, like how do we create some sort of practice that stay, that helps them stay consistent with this? Because that's really what, what they need. And, and Susie, I bet those, those results would change if, if, you know, these students a year later were actually consistent with this practice. Because it definitely builds over time. So I think, um, Susie, I, I was talking to one of our other mind body facilitators, um, and she says that she's running a group right now with a, an M2 student. So are some of our medical students, I think, in terms of the sustainability, I think, you know, um, trying to trying to engage those people who've actually gone through the program and had such an impact with that might be helpful, but I don't know. So I, that was the first time I had heard about that. So I don't know, Susie, you might want to, I don't know if you want to make a comment or observation about that. Pipe in about that. So uh, this semester in the College of Medicine, we have two groups running um, and each one has a faculty member and a medical student leading it. And these medical students, um, both they participated in our level one mind body course, also both participated in our level two um, mind body course last summer that we did virtually. Um, and then they were co facilitators for um, another very similar kind of like a sister program to mind body called creating caring communities. Um, so they got some training on how to actually facilitate the groups and um, Some of those skills and now they are co leading groups for their fellow students, which is incredible. I was just uh, emailing with one of them this morning with, you know, I, I know they get a little bit nervous. They're like, okay, so like this week's activity, can you give me any pointers? I'm like, oh, like do this, do this, do this. But um, yeah, we have, we have a couple of the students. I agree with Janet. You know, we try to train up faculty and staff, but the point of this is more of a culture change. We want the students to be involved. We want everyone's participating together. We're all on the same level here. No one is the expert and the, you know, novice. It, we're all learning this and practicing it together. Thanks, Jen.
This is a lovely pause. If someone has a question that they'd like to ask, you can just see yourself or put it in the chat. Well, then I, I will go ahead and ask another question. And again, if you have one, I think we have time to get a few more in. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in is you've all been trained to kind of facilitate this course for students in which it's specifically looking at mind and body skills. But also curious uh, when Vincent, you said, well, I get to know my students in a different way. It's, a, you know, Lori, you were saying that too. I'm curious about the ways um, this has funneled into the ways you think about teaching your non-mind body classes. <laughs> so how that has maybe influenced a different sphere of your teaching. That's a great question. I can kind of start it out while you guys are thinking of the ways you implement it in your classes. Um, kind of like I said, we have this other program, Creating Caring Communities, which is kind of an offshoot of my body. We have kind of had little programs kind of shoot off of it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Sometimes we've had facilitators start their class with like a mindful minute, you know, start with a deep breathing exercise, really quick, you know, like three, three to five minute type thing, but start every class that way. Um, another component of mind body is a check-in where everyone goes around and you actually check in with yourself, with the group. How are you doing? And not just I'm good, thanks, next person, but like, how are you actually doing? And we've had some faculty members um, introduce that to their class, starting class out, smaller classes, obviously, going around and um, how, how are you? How are you actually right now? And taking some time for self-reflection and practicing mindful listening, which I think we all can use practice in because it's very easy to be on our phones, be multitasking and not totally listening to each other. So to be there in the present moment with everybody and um, practice that skill of mindful listening too. Um, we've had other faculty members bring it to um, community programs that they run, uh, You know, not like UC students, but in our Cincinnati community. Um, yeah, lots of different, different ways like that, but I'll, I'll open it up to the rest of my panelists here on how they've incorporated it. Kimber, I will say that I took, um, I think last year I was involved in the faculty group that you led and it was fantastic. And I learned a lot of things there too and that I incorporate in my classes now. And some of the things, one, one of the practices that I, I do frequently with my students is something that I learned from, I think from you actually, where the students write on a card um, three things that they'd like to leave at the door. You know, just like, you know, things that I'm thinking right now that I, to be able to pay attention in this class and get out of this class what I need to, I need to park this, the parking lot, right? And then, um, so, you know, write down on your parking lot, throw that parking lot away if you want to, or keep it and that knowing that you can come back and worry about those things after class is over. So I, I've been, I've been doing that frequently. And then I'll be brief because I know other people have probably lots of even more wonderful ideas. But one thing that I've started, especially now that I'm teaching synchronous classes via um, WebEx is um, like just starting just uh, the very first thing, like Susie mentioned with just, we're going to focus on our breath for for two minutes, that's it. That's, you know, that we're, and I'll lead them through a quick, like, you know, meditation, like script a little bit to help them focus. Um, but just giving them permission to be fully present in the moment and be fully present at class. You don't have to have 5 million windows open. You don't have to be checking your phone right now. This is where you're supposed to be. And so I do that. And then um, the last thing that I've been doing is I've been like, um, just these little self-care things. Like, what are you doing to take care of yourself? And I mean, beyond just like massages and pedicures, like some things are hard that you have to do working out. Like nobody likes to do that. Right. I mean, some people do, but you know, like what, what, what are the things that you, those, some of those more difficult things and, and just having a little discussion. So the first five, so five or so minutes of my class, my, my department head would probably say they're unproductive, but I think they're very productive because it really helps my students um, just to center and come to class and, and, you know, be fully present. So those are my things. And then I'll, I'll let the other panelists speak. Leslie, I know you're an awesome teacher, but I'll tell you, that's probably the most productive, right? Isn't that crazy? It allows them to be productive for the rest of the time. 
Um, I teach big classes. Um, I'm an adjunct. I'm not a, I'm not a, a faculty member though I am. Um, but, uh, and, I, and I work for the colleges in staff uh, predominantly, but uh, my classes are large. They're 60, 65 students. So to do a check-in, we'd, we'd be there for the entire semester. Um, and they come from all over the university because this is for a, um, a minor program that we teach. So um, it's really interesting. They're all levels. Uh, some are, you know, first years, some are uh, you know, in exploratory. I have students from the medical college, which is awesome. Um, uh, we have CCM students, we, you know, they're from all over, mostly our business students. But uh, at the very beginning of the semester, I tell them about my body. Um, I tell them, you know, kind of what it means to me and that I'm there as a resource for them if they get it, especially in these virtual semesters that if they get at a point where they're just really covered up that they can be very transparent with me and I will help them in any way that I can guide them in any way that I can uh, because you know as we know some some of our students this is you know these are skills and tools um, for their toolbox but if those you know if those tools aren't working they have you know they're going to need to be recommended farther right and we have kids that really struggle um, and so CAPS is you know, is that next step for them? But um, but I found that then I I also do a um, a short meditation with them at the very beginning of class. They probably think, oh man, we're in for a weird one now. You know, um, but they um, they begin to think of me as an old hippie, which is cool at my age of the game. And the other piece of it is that they are they feel comfortable telling me when something's going on in their lives. And with classes that size, and I know you all probably have the same. It's amazing what goes down. This semester I've had two students that have lost their grandparents. I have one that had a mom with open heart surgery. I had it, you know, so life continues to happen. And if they can feel comfortable coming to you, because maybe all their professors aren't aren't that way. They're not approachable. And I think we need that more now than we ever have before in the last year that we've had. So that's what I do. Yeah, at CCM we have a bit of a trouble right now. We have all we have a lot of faculty who are who are uh, who are trained facilitators, but we are not filling up all of our sections. And so uh, we have a new program there that I'm a co-director of with uh, Amy Johnson, who a lot of you know, and she's fantastic. And so what we've been trying to do is to sort of like slip this into classrooms. And um, y you know, I think it's I think it's really I think it's working. So I, I do I do these you know some of these skills in in my classrooms in a formal way, some in an informal way. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, there are times in the semester that we set aside four classes to just do this so that at least they get four of the nine. And, um, and I, I, I think that, I think that it has, it has an impact and they don't feel like they are, have to like give more time to it. Um, and then on a personal note, I have to say like it is enabling me to see my students differently. Like I, I really, and like, okay, I'm gonna see them for where they are right now uh, as much as I can. And uh, that sort of slows down things maybe with how much I get through the material, but I think the material is heard in a different way. And I'm definitely seeing my students in a different way. I love that idea of seeing our students in a different way. And sometimes I do need to slow down and, and be more mindful to appreciate the student who is not turning in assignments or who has an attitude in class. It's not necessarily that they are hostile or a jerk. If I slow down, I can almost always find that they are struggling on some level. And if I can be more mindful about how I interact with them, it, it usually results in more productive interactions. And it's really, it's all of our students have it tough. 
this wonderful opportunity to come to get a great education, but it's life, well, life is hard. And so I, I love working these techniques into every class. And even I love Jen's example of every time you reach for that doorknob, that if you stop and you breathe. And I like to start class that way. I also took Kimber's, uh, I forget what we called it, the community of working mindfulness into teaching. But to st sometimes I start class with a ringing my bell and just to take a moment to separate pre-class from class. And I find it very comforting to say to myself, there's nothing else you need to be doing right now. There's nowhere else I need to be. And so I like to say that for my students. And I appreciate that Leslie said it too during our meditation that it, it's so hard to focus our attention. And yet these little mindfulness techniques help us do it. And I think alleviate a lot of stress for our students. But I love all of these ideas. So thank you for sharing them. Yes. I just want to be looking at the time. We have a couple minutes left. Um, and I, I want to just do a little post housekeeping at the end of the session and then um, Vin's going to kind of a poem to take us out. Um, first, I just want to thank all of our panelists today. What a rich conversation. And um, what struck me so much is about a community of those of you who are participating. I feel like we have a growing mindfulness community at UC. Um, and I think that has largely been speared by the mind body panel. Um, these people here, um, but also this program that has been going on now. Susie, how long has it been? Do you know it's how long been it's been? Like eight years. I think it's, we're, this is our eighth year. It's a long time. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I think we're beginning to see that. So um, please, please, if you're interested, um, sign up to a time body skills program. Um, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat about that. Also, if you wouldn't mind for a moment, just filling out a survey um, about just this wellness win, we'd love to hear your feedback. It's the first time we've done it. So any feedback that you have, but I just wanna thank you all for your time. That's always come up a lot today that time is important. And so I appreciate you sharing it with us today. Um, we thought we'd, we'd end with the poem and Vincent, I'm gonna let you take it away. So um, every one of the weeks that we work with the students, uh, each session ends with a poem. And um, this one is called Important. It's by Helen M. Luke. We hurry through the so-called boring things in order to attend to that which we deem more important, interesting. Perhaps the final freedom will be a recognition that everything in every moment is essential and that nothing at all is important. Well, again, I want to thank everyone for being here today um, and those really lovely words, Vincent. I did put in the chat the website where you can find out more information about the Mind Body Skills program. And um, I just can't say enough how much I thank you. I feel like the more that we hear people talk about this, the more that we create a context and draw people into a fold where we can all just be a little bit more mindful and more present in our lives. So thank you for sharing your practices today and your experience. Um, and if anybody has uh, any questions, you could email Susie McDonald. Susie, would you mind putting your email in the chat? Because it's not easy to find because it's your, your, your six, two is then your, your last name. There it is. Great. So, um, so if you have any questions, please email Susie. And again, Susie, when is the next one coming up? Is it the next training is May 2nd through 5th. Uh, we still have, I think, maybe like one or two spots open. So please reach out to me if you're interested. After that, our next one will probably be in November. So, uh, but again, if you're interested in that, reach out to me. We're happy to like hold a space for you because um, they do fill. <laughs> Super. I hope you all have a lovely day and thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Kimber.